Welcome to Sailing Vessel Seeker. But this video is not about sailboats, it's about submarines, which is one of my passions too. And recently in the news, the submarine Defender, built by Simon Lake over a hundred years ago, was found laying on the bottom in Long Island Sound with all the other wrecks there. It took a commercial diver named Richard Simon to find it. He went through all the records and identified this one wreck that was supposed to be an unknown wooden vessel. They dove it, and to say the least, they were a little more than just a bit excited to find out they had found Defender. Now, Defender wouldn't have been a hard submarine to identify because it had wheels. Simon Lake put wheels on his submarines. Even his very first design for a submarine called Argonaut was designed with wheels. And it's a brilliant idea because this is the 1890s. There's no such thing as sonar. There's not even a fish finder. So finding a wreck when you're underwater is, you know, looking through a little viewport and maybe you can see seven, 10 feet ahead of you. Well, that's no way to find a wreck. But Simon knew that if you put wheels on it, you can go out to where you know the wreck is on the surface, drop to the bottom, the current's not gonna drift you off to the side, and you can run a grid because you know which direction you're going by a compass, you know how many times the wheels have turned, you can find that wreck. And once you find it, finding it again is easy, and you, do, you can stay there with it. You've got a submarine, you've got a snorkel for air going to the surface, you've got a diver's lockout chamber, the diver can exit, he can perform salvage work on the wreck, bring it back inside, you can become a millionaire with this. And Simon thought, oh, this design's fantastic. And it'll be an easy sell. No, he knocked on every door of every investor in New York City and nobody would give him a dime. It's like, you can't open up a hole in the bottom of a boat, it'll sink. That's how boats go to the bottom in the first place. Well, Simon knew better. I mean, we all know better. You can take a glass, you can turn it upside down and put it in a bucket of water. You can see that it's got air trapped in it. You know, it, it compresses a little bit, but there's air there. So, but he couldn't sell this idea. So he built Argonaut Jr. Now Argonaut Jr. is a prototype submarine. He didn't want to build this thing, but he had to build something so that he could prove that this lockout chamber, which was the entire sub, and this diver's hatch thing would work. So broke, he left New York, he goes over to Atlantic Highlands, he borrows money from his aunt, he recruits his cousin, Bart Champion, to build Argonaut Jr. It's about 14 feet long, nine feet tall, has wheels, a hand crank to power the wheels, no gasoline engine in Argonaut Jr. It has the hatch in the bottom of it so that they can exit and prove that this works. They built it, they dove it, it worked. People looked at it and said, no, no, that's not working. He could bring up crabs and fish and clams and it's like, no, no, that's that, you, you took those. <laughs> Until they wrote their names on wooden shingles, tied it to a rock and threw it out into the bay. Simon sank the submarine to the bottom, opened up the hatch, went outside, collected the shingles, came back up, handed the shingle to him. Guess what happened then? Finally, Simon gets his money. He's gotten his investors, he builds the Argonaut, he becomes a millionaire and he goes on to invent many other submarines and devices for salvaging uh, goods off the bottom because everybody knew where the wrecks were. They just couldn't get to them. Simon came past that obstacle with wheels on a submarine. And that's why I was fascinated with Argonaut Jr. because it's kind of small enough you could build it at home and it had wheels on it. And I just love that idea. Thing I didn't have, five tons of lead. You need a lot of lead ballast to get a submarine that big to go to the bottom. Until I was building Seeker, then all of a sudden, I've been out collecting wheel weights and bullets and melting them down into lead ingots. I didn't have five tons of lead, I had 15 tons of lead. So we took a break from building Seeker and we built a replica of Simon Lake's 1895 Argonaut Jr. This video is about that build and diving that submarine. Now to get started on this build, the first thing we had to do is get every piece of information we could about the original. So there were some accounts about it, but mainly somebody took pictures of the Argonaut Jr. rotting away in a yard somewhere. And from that, we could get a lot of information about the size, the uh, use of portholes, the use of anchors, the chain drive for the wheels, a lot of information. But unfortunately, we had nothing from the inside of the submarine. So when it came to that, we did a lot of deductive reasoning from it, uh, and I decided on going with six ballast tanks. Those are the tanks that take on water to make the sub heavy enough to sink to the bottom. He probably didn't use six tanks. I decided I wanted both soft and hard tanks. A soft tank is just open at the bottom, so as you go down, if you have any air in a soft tank, 
the pressure increases the deeper you go that air will compress and then you have less air you go down faster that's how a soft tank works a hard tank is one that can be closed off both the top and bottom so whatever air you capture in it at the surface or halfway down you maintain that volume of air that displacement doesn't change so the idea was i'm going to try and trim this submarine so that i can hover uh above the bottom you know under the surface but above the bottom and uh that was an interesting chest run we also had uh, scuba tanks now, simon lake didn't have scuba tanks because and they weren't even invented yet. So what Simon did is he got uh, tanks that were used on soda fountains. If you look in this picture underneath the table there, there's two tanks. And uh, he got those off of a soda fountain that went defunct. Now, fortunately, this is 1890 and they have indoor plumbing. And with indoor plumbing comes plumbing issues. And they had pumps that would be used to correct issues in the plumbing. He used a plumber's pump to pump air into the soda fountain tanks. That wouldn't have given him a lot of air. This man is taking a lot of risk. The hull is described as being watertight due to canvas covered with tar. It must have had two layers of pine boards that sandwich that tar layer. And that's the best we can figure out from the structure. Now, we didn't do that. We had scuba tanks, we had uh, plywood, we had epoxy. And so we laminated sheets of plywood together with epoxy, a much stronger build than what uh, Simon would have dove. So my hat's off to the man that takes that kind of a risk to prove his point. Now, before beginning the real construction, I built two models. The first one was a display model. It gave me the opportunity to see how everything would be laid out and how much room would be left over once scuba tanks were installed, how we'd lay out all the plumbing for the various ballast tanks and the valves for those ballast tanks, where the lead bars would go, all of that. The second one is a water uh, model, so it could go into the water, but it was all sized appropriately and weighted appropriately. So it would let me see how much freeboard would be left over. And that's once the submarine's in the water with uh, no ballast water on board, but weighted properly, how much of the submarine would actually be still sticking out of the water? We needed enough so that the deck would be dry and that waves from the lake wouldn't uh, possibly crash over and go through the conning tower. Uh, where our top hatch was. We also wanted to see that once the ballast tanks were flooded, which weight was added for that, that it would be sufficient to carry the submarine to the bottom on its own. So once those things were done, we could start real construction. Now I had a third reason for building the two models. I have a CNC table. It's a five by nine table it means it can take a full sheet of plywood and the plans for the submarine were all in CAD. So I had laid out the pieces in CAD so that I could cut those panels on the CNC table. And building the models allowed me to verify that the paths were right and I could get some practice doing it before I started using full sheets of plywood. So if you got a CNC table, building a plywood submarine goes a lot quicker because it's not just one or two panels. There's lots of layers to it. So we need to build up for the conning tower, for example, it was uh, over an inch thick. So it's several layers of plywood, but they're all cut the same shape and then glued together. They're laminated together with epoxy. Once the plywood panels were finished being cut and glued up, it was time to reconfigure the CNC table for the plasma torch. This allows us to cut steel and very intricate parts like these sprockets for the drive handle and the large sprocket with 120 teeth that goes behind the large wheel on the submarine out on one side of it. That would drive that wheel underwater. Maybe Simon Lake got his sprockets off industrial machinery or maybe farm equipment, but having a plasma torch on a CNC machine, he would have loved that. I then laminated up one by fours into curved beams and glued those to the top and bottom deck. Again, lead is used to clamp all this stuff together. And the wheels were laminated up out of three layers of two by sixes. Next came fabricating steel, which would hold the tiller arm and the drop weight system underneath the bottom of the submarine. Then it was time to melt down our lead ingots and cast weights that would be used for the drop weight system. These are all custom length to fit into the frame at various locations. And our mold was made so that we could readjust it for various lengths of these weights. They go anywhere from 70 to almost 300 pounds each. Then the wheels were fitted, the ballast tanks were put together, the framing went up, and the top of the submarine went onto that. Plumbing for the ballast tanks was fitted in, and then we started sheeting the side of the submarine. This was also multiple layers, four layers each side of the submarine. So once it's done on one side, you crawl inside to the ballast tanks 
and glue them to the whole side that you just put on. Then it's time to take it out into the yard, flip it over onto its side, and finish putting those layers on the exterior. Once we had a completed hole, it was time to add the drop weights to the system underneath. To do this, we set the drop weights in order on top of cribbing on the trailer, lifted the submarine up, and set it down on top of the drop weights. Each drop weight goes up on one side of the drop weight frame that's just welded into place. The other end of the weight is lifted up with jacks and cribbing until we can close the locking bar on the other side. It's basically a round bar with an angle iron attached to it, but it has a lip on it that is secured by a dog, and that dog is on a handle that goes up into the submarine. So I can turn that handle, release that dog, that side of the drop weight system opens up and all the drop weights drop to the bottom at one time. And with the weights locked in, it was time to go to the lake. And it was not the launch that I planned. I had steel ramps to put on the back of the trailer and a winch to gently roll the submarine off the trailer and into the water. Uh, that's not what happened, but I'm glad what happened happened at the boat ramp after I had lined the trailer up with the ramp and not on the highway going to the ramp because the hitch pin broke. I didn't ever find the thing. The off the submarine goes into the lake and uh, yeah, that, uh, that got the blood pressure up quite high, but everything was fantastic. The, the trailer was chained to the axle of the submarine, the, the big axle, and it went out and it's set on the bottom and come to find out trailers don't weigh that much in the water. They, they got four tires, so recovering it with scuba was not a hard thing to do. But the nice thing is it had chains that went around the trailer and around the axles of the submarine. So it just sat out there like it was moored out there. And boy, that was, we got off easy with that. So we drug the trailer back out, took the submarine over to the dock and uh, the rest of it wasn't too bad. You always gotta be prepared for some problems. And one of the problems I had was there was a place along the hull that was leaking. We were taking in water, not a lot, but enough to be annoying. We were planning for a couple of weeks in the water and none of the internal lead was in the submarine. So those two ends of the submarine that take all that lead, those were empty. We put all that in after it's in the water. And in fact, it rode along in a U-Haul truck. We didn't want that kind of weight on, on the trailer. But anyway, this, this water leak, you know, it's like, what are we gonna do? Turns out, Gorilla Glue. It cures in water, right? So we pressurized up the inside of the submarine. All the water goes out through the crack instead of coming in. And once that's starting to happen, I just put a little Gorilla Glue along the edge, turned off the air, and it just stopped right in the crack. Gave it a couple minutes, depressurized submarine problems taken care of. So there's always a solution out there. You just got to figure out what it is and, and do your best with it. Once that was done, all the lead bars go in and that's a day's worth of work to move all the, oh, it was, it's five tons less 3000 that was already on the drop weight system. So a lot of lead bars going into that submarine. They're all numbered and labeled and, and cut to fit in exactly to where they go into that uh, stack. So it worked out well, it just took time. Then it was ready for the first dive. And I did that on my own because I didn't want anybody else to die in this thing. And uh, I tell you what, those points in our lives, that is, that's when you really know you're living well, when you're, when you're actually go. doing a dive in a submarine that you built at home, hoping that everything works out well. And guess what? It worked out beautiful. And I want to explain this portal in the bottom hatch to you. Now think about it, the submarine's about nine feet tall. The water pressure at the bottom of the submarine is greater than the water pressure at the top of the submarine. But when you fill it with air that pushes the water out the bottom of the submarine, the top part of our submarine is pressurized. It now wants to explode. The bottom part of the submarine is perfectly ambient. It's perfectly equalized air pressure to water pressure outside. So this hatch in the bottom of the submarine has an acrylic viewport on it that's held on by four bolts and those bolts have springs on them. So if you push down on the acrylic, you can actually press it away from the hatch. And that's beautiful because when the air pressure is just a little higher than the water pressure outside, the water goes down through that acrylic and then air starts bubbling down through that acrylic. And you know, because it makes this roaring noise, that you're now ambient. Your air pressure inside the submarine is equal to the water pressure at the bottom hatch of the submarine. And that's when it's okay 
to open that bottom diver's hatch. And that was a lot of fun to do. Eerie too, because when you open that bottom diver's hatch, you see this mass of water down there. If the top hatch were to come undone or explode at that moment, you'd have this massive column of water going up through the submarine and um, that wouldn't be healthy. Yeah, so. The other thing that was curious to me uh, that I knew would happen, but I didn't think it would be quite as dramatic, is once the submarine's all buttoned up again, it has air pressure in it that's equal to the water pressure at the bottom of the submarine. So there's no way you want to open that top hatch. It would blow off with a force. So you open a valve and you vent that air out of the submarine. And when you do that, you're quickly lowering the pressure inside the hull. And when that happens, fog forms. And it's not a little bit of fog. It's a very dense fog that forms. It actually makes breathing difficult but it was an amazing thing to see. And we got to see it lots of times because we dove the submarine for two weeks. We'll take you through a dive. Now, the first thing you have to get used to is comments from people in boats and on shore because we look like this skinny little kayak out on the water, but when they're watching it, they can watch seven people climb up out of the center of it and stand all over the deck and nothing happens. So the stability of Argonaut in the water is amazing. She's got all this weight and buoyancy and she is stiff. And whereas you could walk one person out onto the bow, it doesn't make any difference. There's hardly any shift in it at all. Now, Simon and Bart would have had to row Argonaut Jr. out to their test site. Uh, we cheated a little bit. Uh, those two little tires that have a shaft going up into the submarine and a tiller handle, that's so you can steer while you're on the bottom. But we mounted a trolling motor between them and a couple AGM batteries inside, some alligator clips, and I could power up that motor. And then we could steer and move on the surface under that thing's power. And that was pretty interesting to see too, because we look like a kayak going along with a bunch of people sitting on top and uh, nobody's paddling. And the tiller arm is way in the back of the submarine. So what I did is I tied some ropes to it and I had some eye hooks and the submarine's frame. And so ropes would go out and then up to the conning tower so I could pull one or the other and turn and steer while on the surface and while in the conning tower. Now, once out on the dive site, we had a hookah system where we'd put that over into the water after it was running. And it's a surface applied air system. It's just a, a five horsepower gasoline engine and an oilless air compressor. And it has uh, a lines coming off that. We only used one line to the submarine, but it can supply four divers in the water down to 60 feet. So it's a lot of air and it's easy to use. And it kept me from having to use the scuba tanks that I had inside the submarine. That way I could keep them in reserve or for an emergency if I needed. And I always knew I had a good air supply from the hookah. It uh, also has a dive flag on it, so it lets people see exactly where you are out in the lake. Then when you're ready, you climb inside, you close down the hatch, and you latch it down. You make sure those latches are good and tight. Then you open up the valves that allow the air to escape out of the ballast tanks. Water starts coming in from below and those ballast tanks start filling. Hard and soft tanks, everything is open. And the submarine sits lower and lower and lower in the water until just a little bit of it's showing and it's not going to go under and that's by design. I'm not sure how Simon Lake dove his submarine but our Argonaut Jr. we found the way to dive it that's really controlled. Now what we did first when we got out there and on site is we lowered our anchors to the bottom. They weigh 120 pounds each so that's 240 pounds sitting on the bottom. So the submarine would have actually come up out of the water just a little bit, probably wouldn't have even noticed it. But then we flooded the tanks and we sat low in the water, but didn't go under. Then you raise the anchors and instead of raising the anchors, you start lowering the submarine because the submarine doesn't have enough buoyancy left for another 240 pounds. So it starts to go down and we can control that gradually by just the speed of which we raise the anchors or rather lower the submarine. There's two 12 volt winches on each end of the submarine above the anchors. Harbor freight, you just push a button, you wanna go up or down with that anchor. So we go up with both anchors and instead of the anchors coming up, the submarine starts to go down. You want that controlled descent, at least I wanted that controlled descent because I'm always putting air into the submarine by the hookah. 
And as the submarine goes deeper and deeper, the water pressure outside gets greater and greater. But with that constant flow of air and a controlled slow descent, the air pressure gets to catch up with the water pressure. So it never is in a condition where the water pressure keeps growing and growing and wanting to crush that submarine. I'm not sure what Simon Lake did in that. I don't think he actually used his air cylinders to compensate for being on the bottom. I think he only used that air to blow his ballast tanks. Again, he was a brave man. Slowly down, building air up as we go down, checking it to make sure that bottom hatch can burp air or waiting to go down anymore until air does flow out that hatch. Then you know your ambient, you can go on down deeper and deeper. We dove 20, maybe 25 feet max during those two weeks. But in theory, we could go a lot deeper because it's just like scuba diving. You go down deeper, you put more pressurized air in. And the pressurized air is not just getting breathed into your lungs, it's in the whole submarine. You're breathing pressurized air. So you got the same problem as a scuba diver. If you go to 120 feet, you probably ought to only spend about 20 minutes there before you start coming back up because nitrogen starts building up in your blood. You'll get the bends just like a scuba diver would. So being at 20, 25 feet, that's nothing. You could do that all day long, every day for weeks, and it wouldn't make any difference. That's what we did. And here's a remarkable thing. Six people on board the submarine, you open up the diver's hatch, you step out onto the bottom of the lake, you can actually reach down, grab the bottom of the submarine and lift it up because the submarine weighs just maybe 75 pounds. And then you can lean into it and you actually start walking along the bottom of the lake carrying six friends and a six ton submarine. It's like a hermit crab. It's a fantastic feeling. And how about the wheels? They work good. Now our problem there at that lake was the bottom was rocky. We didn't have very many flat spots on it. So we could set the submarine down, but if the bottom was sloped, we wouldn't have our steering wheels on the bottom. Yeah, I think if I was to build this submarine again, I'd have two chains and a differential so I could steer with the big wheels. Not sure what Simon did. I don't think he did that. Probably not because if he's in a bay like I'm in now, the bottom's pretty flat. You wouldn't have to weigh very much to get those tiller wheels onto the bottom. And I think we built what he built. It just doesn't work very well in a lake in Oklahoma, but we had a lot of fun crawling up and over the big rocks. And you can, you can, you can have this massive rock on the bottom and you bring the wheel up to it. The submarine doesn't weigh, but maybe 75 pounds if you have it ballasted right. And you keep cranking it, it's hard to go up, but that rubber grabs into that rock and up and over that wheel goes and you come down on the other side with a little bit of a thud. So it works. We went up hills and down hills and we played around with a lot. We even had a time where we, we brought in rocks from the bottom of the lake and stacked them up on both ends of the submarine to give us about another three, 400 pounds of weight. And we got all the wheels to sit on the bottom even when the bottom wasn't level. <laughs> but we couldn't move the submarine. It then weighed a lot and the hand crank could turn the wheels, but they would slip on the mossy rock. So it was a nice experiment, didn't work. And then there's the hard ballast tanks. You know, those tanks that close off at the top and bottom and they, they trap the amount of air that's in them so the displacement doesn't change. I tried that out, didn't work at all. I think my problem was, because I could dive underneath it and look up into the area where the drop weights are and I could see bubbles in there, a lot of them. And there's vents drilled along the side, but they wouldn't even make it to the vents and get out. So that air is giving me a problem because if we go up a little bit, those air bubbles get bigger you get more buoyant and you go up even more. Or if you go down a little bit, they get smaller, you lose buoyancy and so you go down even more. Uh, so that would have messed it up. Um, most submarines that are trying to hover or can hover use thrusters, a mechanical motor, like a trolling motor to either push them up or down a little bit to hold them there. Or they have dive planes on them and their momentum through the water has water flowing over these dive planes so they can trim the boat down or up based on the dive planes. So what about accidents? Yeah, there's two of them that come to mind. Uh, the first one was uh, probably the most dangerous. Um, what I had done is I had come up to the surface many times. And when I do that, you, you open up the valves and you start pushing air into all your ballast tanks and the water gets pushed out the bottom. And then you pop up to the surface. Well, I was doing it again and I popped up to the surface, but just as I was coming up to the surface, I shut off the air going into 
the ballast tanks. So they're not getting any more air. But I'm thinking, eh, they got lots of air in them. Now we're going up, no big deal. Well, what happens is when the air vents out of the ballast tanks, some of it goes up into that area where the drop weights are. So I had air there. And it will eventually bleed out through those uh, vents that we drilled through the beams down there. And that's what happened. We hit the surface. It's, it's a great thing. You pop out of the water, you know, spectacular, and all this air rushes out. And then I lost too much air. And then I got to doing something else in the summer, and I don't remember what it was. But in a little while, I heard this, and you felt it too. And I look out the viewport, and we're on the bottom again. Now, the dangerous part of this is we're on the bottom again, but I had shut off the air coming into the submarine. I had no ambient pressure in the submarine to deal with being 23 feet down. My air pressure was right for being on the surface. So at that point, there was a lot of water pressure pushing in on the hull, wanting to pancake us. So immediately I turned the air back on and said thank you. And finally, the air was enough to push water and air out the bottom hatch. I know we're ambient. Then I start bleeding air into the uh, ballast tanks again and up we go and I leave the valve on. The next time it was that hard tank that gave me a problem. I'm thinking okay we're gonna try and come up really slow and controlled on these hard tanks again. It's when I'm trying to be neutrally buoyant and so uh, all I'm gonna do is I'm going to push air into one hard tank. Now before this I had all my tanks open and I push air into all the tanks at one time. Uh, this hard tank is a only one tank out of six, and it has a small opening in the bottom. And so when the air comes in, all the water has to go out through that little hole. And immediately when I turned that valve on and shot that air into the tank, this happened. And what that was is that tank got way too much air too quick. It couldn't get the water out, and so it exploded. And I thought it had shot out underneath the gasket because there's an acrylic viewport on that hard tank and I can look down and see the water level in it. But that's not what happened. A couple days later, it was obvious what had happened. The wall on the side of the submarine was spongy. Water had gotten in there. It had actually sheared the wall of the submarine, the hull, from top to bottom. It had torn apart the layers of, of plywood, split the epoxy, had cracked and come out over the top of the deck right where that viewport is and had shot water out. And then it went back and was solid by all appearances on the day it happened. But a couple days later, you, you push on there and it's all mushy. And I know it was split top to bottom. Later on when I got the submarine out of the water, I could see the crack on the top of the submarine and I could see it on the bottom of the submarine. And that's the day we decided you know, we're terminating dives because I'm kind of like a submarine that has a good hull. Getting the submarine back out of the water was a lot of fun too. Uh, we now knew our trailer went into the water and set on the bottom just fine. So we just put the trailer down the boat ramp and left it parked on the bottom of the lake, brought the submarine over on top of it. We closed the top hatch, pressurized up, opened the diver's hatch down below and started chunking lead from both ends of the submarine through the hatch and let it fall down into the trailer. Once the trailer's full, that load goes back home and do it again and another load. Now, the last part was the drop weight system. So after all that lead's out of there, I pulled the handle on the drop weights with the trailer underneath, of course, and all that lead drops out onto that trailer. Well, at that point, the submarine doesn't have any weight in the bottom of it. So it pops to the surface violently and rolls over mostly on its side. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. That load of lead went out, the trailer went back in one more time. The submarine was brought over and kind of straightened back up onto the trailer. Then the whole thing could go home with us. And you might ask, hey, what you do with the submarine? Well, it was really disappointing. You know, schools have gotten to where they want to teach to a test and pretty much nothing else. But I actually offered the submarine on the trailer, delivered to any school that wanted it to be part in their school's location with curriculum to go along explaining Boyle's Law and all about Simon Lake. And I had no takers, nothing in the Tulsa area. And that was so disappointing. So I decided, okay, well, we'll just sell it off for, for whatever we can get for it. It'll be a, a playhouse in somebody's backyard. And that didn't happen either. Instead, a crazy man 
okay, I may offend somebody here, but he's a faith healer. But this guy has more money than he knows what to do with because he's just buying stuff from all across the United States. He has airplane hangers out near Las Vegas, just, just full of stuff. It was an, it was an amazing collection. Uh, and so Argonaut went to there and then it got sold and sold and sold again. Somebody painted it swimming pool blue. So, you know, my lesson there is don't become attached to the things you build. I got a lot of a great experience and memories out of diving uh, Argonaut Jr., the remake, and that was enough. The rest of it, ah, who cares? Life is short. Enjoy it. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to learn more about Simon Lake and Argonaut Jr., you can see our website, ArgonautJr.com. And if you like the video, we'll have others like it. You can subscribe to our channel and click that bell for a reminder when we put out something new. Hope you go out on a little adventure too. Simon would like that. Take care, guys.